everyone. I'm Sister Vasa, and welcome back to Saturday Morning Live with Sister Vasa. Today, I am delighted to tell you, my beloved viewers, that we will once again be having an interview on this show, and our special guest today is the Archimandrite and Professor Father Kirill Havarun of Loyola Marymount University. Now, Father Kirill is not only a prominent Orthodox theologian and thinker on the topics of ecclesiology, patristics, the confluence of traditions. He is author of many publications. Most recently, I would say most significantly, uh, his book uh, published in 2018, Political Orthodoxies, The Unorthodoxies of the Church. And then a year previous to that book, he published Scaffolds of the Church Towards Post-Structural Ecclesiology. He is a provocative thinker. He is very respected and happens to be a good friend of mine, which is why I have invited him to do an interview on the show, because I happen to have crossed paths with Father Kirill several times at various academic conferences. I should say more specifically about his present day position that he, as while being himself from Ukraine, uh, where he was originally educated, actually as a, uh, a younger man, he, he's not an old man today, but as a younger man, he actually uh, graduated from the Department of Theoretical Physics at the Kiev National University. Uh, yes, theoretical physics. Fun fact about Father Kirill that you perhaps didn't know. He also graduated from Kiev Theological Seminary, went on to graduate from the uh, Kiev Theological Academy, and then he also got a degree uh, in Athens at the Department of Theology at the National and Kapodistrian University at Athens. He speaks fluent not only fluent Ukrainian and Russian, but also fluent modern day Greek. And as you will hear, his English is also very good. What else should I tell you? He was, uh, he received in, uh, in the UK at the University of Durham, his master's and PhD in theology. He wrote his doctorate under the direction of the well-known professor, Father Andrew Louth. By the way, Father Andrew Louth will be also on this show uh, in the near future. He has agreed to do an interview. But anyway, that's just uh, something I wanted to let you know. And then uh, Father Kirill also was very active in the theological department of the Russian Orthodox Church in Moscow for a time. So he was the vice rector and also, yes, of the doctoral school of the Russian Orthodox Church. And then he was, everybody bear with me because I can't cover all of Father's, uh, Father Kirill's very impressive CV, but I just want you to get an idea, those of, you, those of you who don't know him yet, to get an idea of this man's experience and also experience not only in academia, but throughout the Orthodox world and also in ecumenical dialogue. But let me mention, he was first deputy chair of the Committee for Education of the Russian Orthodox Church. So he was very uh, involved, uh, in fact, in charge of the process of reforming the educational system of the Russian Orthodox Church between 2009 and 2012. Just one final thing before we meet uh, Father Kirill, because I will show you our interview that is pre-recorded. I want to tell you that he has been a representative, as far as ecumenical dialogue goes, a representative of the Orthodox Church in Orthodox Lutheran dialogue, in Orthodox Anglican dialogue, Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue, Orthodox Oriental dialogue, and Orthodox Jewish dialogue. And he has been in various functions uh, active in the World Council of Churches, a member of the Faith and Order Commission of the WCC. And, but I'm going to have to stop there, everybody, and get to our interview, for, which has been pre-recorded, and I hope you all enjoy it.
Father Kirill, hello. How wonderful to see you on our show. My pleasure. It's very wonderful to see you as well, sister. I understand you're in New York City right now. Exactly, yes. Participating in a conference organized by Fordham University, by the Orphan Center uh, at Fordham University. It's an, an amazing event. Okay, so you lean in a little bit and, and articulate for us because our sound this week is a little worse since you're, you're using your iPad in your hotel room, right? So right. just be mindful uh, so that we all hear everything you have to say because I think our viewers are very much in interested as they were to hear from Father Trifon last week. Father Kirill, my first question to you, how does your experience of academic theology today, specifically in the setting of an American university, compare with your experience of academic theology in previous years within the structure of an Orthodox church, say the work you did in reforming the system of academic theology within the structure, say, of the church, or the Orthodox church in Moscow? And if you could, as you respond to this question, perhaps uh, tell us, is there in academia, in American academia, perhaps are there constraints of political correctness of a kind that one hears, one reads a lot about, at least I'm in Europe, one hears about trigger-free zones and, and things that uh, sometimes have their positive uh, functions and sometimes uh, seem like constraints on free thought and speech in some ways. Uh, but when one thinks about the church structure, one might think that there uh, might be constraints of another kind or uh, you know, a priori directives about the results of research. So if you could speak to all these things, I will stop talking. All right. Thank you, <laughs> I'll let you... Thank you for your questions. And actually, I especially like that you use the, the phrase uh, structures of the church. That is the phrase that I like uh, as well, and I think it is important uh, to distinguish between the structures of the church and the church per se, or the nature of the church, what I call the nature of the church, because uh, they are quite different, and uh, uh, this distinction allows us to uh, be a bit of critical, maybe, uh, in a very constructive way, I hope, and positive way, about the structures of the church without criticizing the church as such. Uh, the structures are human devices, uh, even they could be inspired by, uh, by the divine revelation that comes through the human mind and to, uh, through the human hands, but still they are handmade. And um, uh, as such, uh, they fail sometimes, and uh, in this capacity they can be criticized. Therefore, I think this, your question creates for me a space to be a bit critical about the structures of the church and then exactly to assess them, uh, uh, I hope, in a, in a constructive way. So I believe, yes, um, there is a difference between the uh, academic structures of the church, of the theological uh, education in, in the church, and the, um, and the theological education in the, in the academia, in the universities, like in the United States. At the same time, they are quite similar. In, in some sense, I believe that the church and academia, uh, in some sense, they serve the same end, the same purpose. And that is truth. They are supposed to, you know, to... Well, that, you that, that, is truth. that is truth. They both serve truth, okay. Yeah, they both serve truth, exactly. And they are supposed, at least they are supposed, to uh, find out truth and to profess truth. Um, that is a, a common ground between the church and the academia. That's why I don't find any uh, you know, conflict for myself, moral conflict or intellectual conflict, to do church work and to do academic work. They're very similar. Of course, they do uh, this work in different ways. And um, uh, the two approaches that they have, uh, the church and the academia, I would de de define those approaches in the way that I use also in one of my books. Uh, one approach is evidential and another one is uh, foundational. Uh, the approach of the church is foundational in the sense that the church comes from certain principles uh, and uh, is based in finding truth and professing truth on certain, certain principles and that is the purpose of the, uh, of the academic theology in the church. Uh, the 
truth, uh, which is being sold by the universities, is more evidential. It is based on evidence. It is based on facts, on findings of facts, and uh, the exp uh, exploration of reality, which is in front of us. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> those approaches are not quite compatible, I should say, but I think that they should be uh, reconciled somehow. And I believe that is the, the purpose of the academic theology, of the academic work. It's, it's, I consider it as a purpose for myself to reconcile the foundational truth of the church and the evidential truth of academia, so that uh, what we believe to be confirmed, but what we find out through our research, through uh, exploring uh, the reality of the church history, of the church life nowadays. Well, it sounds idealistic, and uh, well, maybe I am idealistic a bit. Uh, many people believe I, I'm not, but I am, I think. And uh, uh, in it, it is very hard to, uh, to reconcile what we believe with what we uh, find out uh, as a result of our research, of our study, especially regarding the history of the church. When, my, when I was in Moscow, and indeed I was in charge of the uh, process of reformation of the theological education in the Russian church, and it was a challenging task. At the same time, it was a really inspiring task, and I, I really uh, invested myself fully in, into this task. And uh, I realized, what I came to realize as a, in the process of, uh, of my activities, is that we need to, certainly we need to have two kind of sides of the theological education, two institutions, if you want, or networks uh, in the theological education. One is to prepare priests. One is to uh, be confined to the seminaries, what we call seminaries. And the other one is uh, a network of academical institutions that do academic work, uh, that approach uh, the same subject as, as the seminaries approach, but from more critical perspective. Uh, we, and they are supposed to, and to, uh, uh, to apply more critical analysis, scientific methods. So essentially, I tried, what I tried to do was to uh, distinguish and to enhance each of those um, uh, branches of, uh, of theology in the church. I find them, uh, them existing also in the American uh, academia. There are seminaries in the, uh, in the United States. There are universities, including confessional universities, that do academic research. Um, I don't see the same striking difference between the academic institutions and seminaries in the United States as I saw them in the in in Russia, for instance, in, or in uh, actually in most uh, educational institutions of the Russian Church. Uh, all the majority of the institutions, the Russian Church, including academic institutions and the clerical institutions, uh, they tend to be more like clerical institutions. In the United States, they tend to be like more academic institutions, and they really do uh, both you of mean, them. You mean theological faculties? Theological faculties, exactly. Uh, um, in the countries like Romania, like Bulgaria, Serbia, and so forth. And, um, uh, and the seminaries in the same, the same country. Sometimes academic institutions, they also uh, prepare priests, and they train priests. So. Certainly in the Orthodox context, in the context of the traditional Orthodox countries, um, uh, the, the theological academy, uh, academies or academic theology tend to be more foundational, foundational than evidential, I should say. And this is a new trend. It, it was not like that, for instance, 100 years ago. Because if we take the Russian church, even 100 years ago, the theological academies were much more evidential, as it were, then they were uh, foundational in many regards. But well, uh, they... say, if I could interrupt you, I'm sorry. Right. Um, wouldn't you say that the more attentive we are to history, the more we are in need of the evidential approach? If one does not uh, recognize the significance of history in its foundational function, I think specifically in an orthodox approach where we're not blind to the development from you know that we don't pretend that there was the ancient church and pretend that we are imitating what happened there we recognize the historical development but i don't see how the study of history specifically can possibly not be evidential you know it's not divorced from the mystery if you could say i like to use uh this this little phrase that that 
that I like to use that the two pillars of tradition are history and mystery. And that one is the study of change and the demonstration of change and the revelation coming through real time, right? But there is the unchangeable, but that which is revealed within and in, in different contexts at different times and to different extents, right? So anyway, my question is that I don't see how there can possibly be a theology that is only foundational if you're defining it as, uh, as if it ever had, uh, you know, as if it could ever be divorced from historical context. Well, exactly. I also believe that it is impossible to divor uh, divorce uh, theology from history. And uh, if we are serious about theology, it should be historical. It should be uh, based on the historical evidence. Uh, the problem is that uh, we are sometimes not quite serious about our own theology. And uh, it happens because of our ignorance of the church history and our, our taking okay, seriously. Okay, well, can you repeat that phrase? You said we are not serious about our own theology? Yeah, I mean that uh, we, um, uh, we have a certain perception. We have a, a certain a preset in our understanding of our doctrine, of our tradition, of our faith. Uh, we believe we know it, we believe we understand it. And uh, as a result, we tailor, as it were, history to fit our beliefs about our past, about our, about our tradition. And this is not a serious approach, I believe. Uh, a serious approach is when we, uh, we, respect, we are respectful to our history, with all, all its complex, uh, complexities, with all its uh, you know, pitfalls and uh, downsides. Uh, we take them seriously and we try to accommodate them to uh, the framework of our faith. Therefore, our faith, our perception of our tradition should be open enough to accommodate those complexities of the past. That right. is my point. And that is the, the job of the academic theology, where it should contribute to, uh, to the development of the confessional theology, as it were, not the other way around. When we, pro when we project our confessional theology upon academic theology and try to preach, you know, our limited perception about the tradition to, to the academic world. Right, right. Um, Thank you for that, Father Kirill. So here's a second question for you concerning social media and globalization. How would you say, you know, as one engaged in pan-Orthodox issues, how would you assess the effects of social media and globalization on church unity? Would you say that community building is happening in the church outside her previous structures that were within so-called real time and space? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing or perhaps both? Well, the short answer to that would, would be both. Uh, and I think what happens to the impact of the social media for the church uh, reflects what happens to the social media as such. And it has been noticed since probably the beginning of the social media uh, that uh, on the one hand, they indeed unite people. Imagine uh, billions of people on the, sharing the same platform of Facebook. Uh, unim something unimaginable in the past, right? At the same time, they speak about, uh, let me spell out this word, this very difficult English word, compartmentalization, right? Uh, of the or, uh, operation of bulbs, information bulbs. Well, everyone, every single individual who is on the social media creates his or her own social bulb, uh, which is comfortable for him or her and feeds his or her preferences. And I believe the same happens in the church, unfortunately. The, the church people have, have been, well, many of them who are active on the social media, uh, they have created their own bulbs and they live in those bulbs. And this added to our traditional compartmentalization, uh, which is ethnic, which, is, uh, which has been described as uh, ethnophiletic, you know, when the churches are really divided in the Orthodox Church, unfortunately, according along the national li uh, lines nowadays. The churches and individuals in those churches and communities are divided along uh, the lines created by those bulbs on the social media, including ideological lines. Uh, I believe the recent um, importance, maybe it's not recent really, but it, it has become recently important, really, and uh, visible. Uh, the division along the ideological lines, like liberals versus conservatives, 
uh, our alignment with the culture wars, which are so much uh, important, in, especially in the American society, but elsewhere as well. Uh, uh, the, the Orthodox Christians uh, having embarked on this division between liberals and, and conservatives, uh, which has been corroborated by, by social media. I think that this is a kind of negative thing, a negative phenomenon. Uh, I, I consider completely wrong identification of the Orthodox Church with either conservative or liberal agendas. It's not, it's not like that. It cannot be like that. The Church is much uh, wider. It's much more um, complex than this just this uh, very simple uh, binary or dichotomy between liberals and conservatives. Uh, so this uh, dichotomization of the Church to liberals and conservatives is not helpful at all. And unfortunately, as I said, it has been uh, facilitated by the, so by, by the social media, which is not the fault of the media. The media is ju is neutral. It's just an instrument. It's us who use this media to, uh, to divide ourselves. Right. Would social media and the discussions therein be challenging the traditional conciliar apparatus that is supposedly right. in place? As we saw leading up to Crete, would you say that perhaps some things were already battled out? And right. well, it's, great. it's a great question. I really like it. In social and, media, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. It's a very good question, and uh, it gives a lot of thing, a lot of uh, food to think about. Um, well, social media certainly facilitate um, horizontal relations between people in the society and in the church so that people uh, can uh, provide their feedback immediately to the you know developments in the church to the uh, to different phenomena in the church scandals or positive things uh, this is a great thing this is if you want this is a sort of flavor of conciliarity in the church certainly so uh, at the same time as i said uh, the idea of a council is not just for the same-minded people to come together and to agree upon everything, but to find a sound and reasonable solution to the issues with, the, uh, with some people to accept those solutions regardless of what they believe, because that is the voice of the church. Well, what happens with the social media is that, is that sometimes if we disagree with something that comes up as a result of the discussion, we just unfriend those people or block those people and just you know, isolate ourselves from those decisions. Therefore, this uh, facility of conciliarity, when conciliarity is to be received by, by the church, that is not really facilitated by the social media. So it's, it has kind of two sides, and uh, it's certainly as a great tool for virtual conciliarity, if you want. At the same time, it's, it, it's, it requires the traditional institutions of the church, like the councils, of course, uh, to, uh, to, be, to play the, still play the key role. One might be concerned that, that actually conciliarity, at least traditionally, does presume face-to-face -face contact, not in the way that we're doing now, but also within the same physical space. At least other sacramental realities of the church or any of the, one would say, we don't really have a set number of sacraments if we're pretending not to subscribe to uh, the, seven, the number seven. Uh, well, not just, okay, I'm not going to get into that right now. But, but it's, it's a very good point at the same time. All the sacraments do require uh, physical presence. And right. for one not to be anonymous, there is that culture of confession, right? And right. that actually is not you know the 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 really loud voices sometimes in the internet that'll be self-proclaimed you know defenders of orthodoxy can often have no skin in the game so to say <laughs> i don't know if that's understandable to you but that's not actually professing the faith in physical space and where your name is on the line uh what am i getting at that i think that the councils even though our bishops today uh, i don't know exactly how they do it in each orthodox church but they do take advantage of, say, conference calls rather than get together. And I think that... And most of them are on, on Facebook as well. <laughs> on Facebook? I don't know. I don't follow any... Uh, I, I don't... They, do. I don't they are. They are. So, uh, what I'm saying is that I think that conciliarity, if it is divorced because of 
technology and the progress of technology from physical time and space. Uh, is there a loss of something that has to be actually preserved? And is this where one puts on the brakes and says, we can't use this technology in this way because having the, the bishops and others that are required at a council meet and also have those, the coffee and the lunch and dinners in between and the liturgical services and to be on that little island together uh, for better or for worse, it, it, it can't be replaced by a conference call that is just limited to discussion. Well, you know? I, yes, yes, I see your point. And I completely agree with your uh, preliminary assessment, which is already in, in your question. Um, I think, uh, yes, theoretically, uh, uh, video conferencing and or face-to-face, uh, -face, literally, I mean, the, uh, the Apple way of uh, doing face-to-face, yeah. Um, FaceTime uh, conversations. Uh, virtually, they can facilitate considerate in the church. We can discuss things, uh, even, you know, between the churches, uh, virtually online. At the same time, I think uh, considerate is a bodily thing. It's, it's a thing. It's something which, is, which should be embodied in, in physically, has its physicalities, if you want. Even the, the word synodos, hence a synodality, right? Uh, it, it comes from the Greek uh, word odos, a way, a path, a road, a physical road. And uh, it happens, synodality happens when bishops strike a road, well, all of them strike a road in order to reach uh, the common destination point, some city, and to uh, find themselves there, to gather there, and to discuss together uh, their issues. So the, the, the very word synodality presupposes physicality of, uh, of conciliarity, right? And I believe it is important that uh, people come together, either bishops or other representatives of the church, clergy, lay, laity. I, I think a consideration should not be uh, excluding uh, other members of the church except bishops. It should include all of them. And uh, they should come together. It is important to celebrate together, certainly. And we cannot do liturgy virtually, right from distance. Uh, you should be there, epitopto, according to Paul, on the same spot. Uh, for the same purpose. And uh, then you celebrate the liturgy, uh, you have your conversations, you have your co Greek coffee, you have your, I don't know, cheese, and uh, uh, and you enjoy uh, conversations. And sometimes mo the most important decisions are taken in the pre conciliar or after conciliar uh, stage, as it were, uh, of, the, uh, of the councils. And uh, that is something that which is really important. I don't want to kind of uh, to be old-fashioned in the sen in the sense that well in the in the past they, they met together we should we should continue like that. No, there is some sense, there is some rationale in uh, physical meetings and I believe it should be uh, should be kept with the church. Thank you Father Kirill. So just one final question but it'll also be a little bit broad. As a theologian and monastic who stems from Ukraine and now it teaches in the so-called diaspora and specifically in the United States, you are well aware that we, the Western Orthodox, are often very affected by the goings on and also the political ones uh, in the home countries or in the countries at least of our mother churches, be that Syria or Ukraine or Russia, Serbia and so forth. So my question to you would be, when we are affected, and I don't mean just because we send perhaps humanitarian aid to war-torn countries like Syria or Ukraine, uh, I mean when we are drawn into discussions of perhaps arguments about and drawn into also making proclamations about certain political uh, events in the home countries, say, I don't really need to mention it to you, but Ukrainian autocephaly, it's not a secret to anyone that that could be quite divisive also in the diaspora. I wanna ask you how you see the connection, I would say, or this kind of involvement on the level just of say discussion or chiming in uh, of our diaspora churches into events that happen in the home countries. 
uh, you know, the positive and negative sides of that, if you could. And perhaps that has to do with the canonical structures and the, uh, the connections there of the vexed question of the connections between the mother churches and those that did not exist in the era of the councils or of our canonical codex. Right, yes, it's also a very good question. And again, I can talk uh, hours uh, about this question, but I'll try to, to confine myself. Uh, especially myself. tailored for you, Father, especially tailored for you. <laughs> right. So, um, well, it is, there is a common belief that the uh, situation in the traditional Orthodox countries is normal. Uh, in terms of uh, jurisdictions, the situation in diaspora, the so-called diaspora, I don't like this word, yeah. uh, in the book is Greek. Uh, the situation in diaspora uh, is abnormal. I think this belief is wrong uh, because we are talking about uh, different kinds of normality. The normality of the countries like Russia or Romania or Bulgaria is the normality of the Roman Empire, actually, where there was a common space, one space, uh, singular space, as it were, and uh, this space was divided into pieces, and each piece was given to a particular church. So, so that, uh, that a particular church uh, occupied a certain space and uh, uh, had a monopoly on that space. The situation before the Roman Empire was different. Uh, the Roman Empire, the early Christian church in the Roman Empire, before the conversion of this empire to Christianity, did not have this idea of territoriality as the, the main framework for itself. It was based on communities. It was based on, on the real people who lived in different places and they came together and they shared their faith, their Eucharist and so forth. Uh, so I believe that the situation in, in the, the diaspora reflects the normality of early Christianity before Constantine, before the church embarked on this idea of territoriality and made ter 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 territoriality its main framework. Therefore, we are talking about two normalities. The normality of diaspora, which is pre-Constantinian, and the normality of the uh, traditional countries, uh, which, uh, which is post-Constantinian. The question is, which normality is more normal? Which normality is more helpful and uh, more efficient for, for the work of the church nowadays? Well, right. my personal belief, I may be wrong, and uh, probably, well, I've been accused already of being wrong uh, regarding this issue that the normality, the pre-Constantinian normality is better for the church nowadays. Uh, and it is for a number of reasons. First, it is focused the normality of this pre-Constantinian diaspora well, to, church. Could you repeat that, that the normality of the church in the pre, you have to, could you please repeat that last phrase? Yes, yeah, so the, I believe that the normality of the pre-Constantinian church and therefore of the church in diaspora is more helpful for our days, then the normality, traditional normality of the traditional countries, which coheres with the situation in the Roman Empire. Right. And I, I will try to prove my, my point. As I said, the church in the time before Constantine, uh, when it was not yet confined to the territories, to the territorial grid of the Roman Empire, was focused not on the territory, but on the communities, of the people. That's right. one thing. In this situation, even several bishops could coexist in the same place, in the same city. It was normal. It was not abnormal. It was okay. Mm -hmm. And I believe this helped communities to develop and to maintain a certain level of quality of church life in those communities. Uh, after Constantine, when the church embarked on another logic, the logic of territory, uh, it refocused itself from communities to super communal structures, to the admi administration of the church, like dioceses, metropolitan, metropolitanates, patriarchates, and so forth. This contributed to the, uh, as it were, quantitization of the church. The church became not so much a concern about the quality of the church life, about the quantity of the church life, which was normal because the church expanded in the Roman Empire, became huge, and uh, had a lot of concerns how to maintain this huge structure, right? right. Nowadays, I believe, it's time for quality. And uh, exactly a refocusing of the church from the administrative structures upon community will contribute to the, to the quality of the church. And the quality of the church nowadays, the quality of any institution in any setting nowadays is secured by competition. Is uh, secured what? Is secured what? 
is secured by competition. Competition. Right. So that is, uh, I know, it's not a popular idea. It's competitive because competition is the opposite to harmony, right? To um, uh, Why don't you explain that. That's fascinating. You think? Repeat that phrase. What did you say? The 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 church's unity is actually the whole thing works because of competition. Yes, I believe that in our days. Well, what I what I said in the beginning is that the primarily concern for the church nowadays is quality of the communal life of the church life, not the quantity. Right. I believe so. That is important. Right. And uh, the quality is secured best by competition. By competition, so right. By competition. Not, not well, the quantity, the quantity is properly challenged by competition, right? But quality is facilitated by competition. Therefore, we need some sort of mild, friendly rivalry, which exists in the, in the diaspora, in right. a sense. And uh, also, there is a rivalry with many other jurisdictions, many other churches, Christian groups in the diaspora, because in the diaspora, uh, the Orthodox Church is in minority and has to compete, has to fight for, for, for young people, for, you know, for membership. It, it has really to be attractive, really to, to keep together people uh -huh. uh, who have many options. It's like a and, capitalist. It's like a. It's like a, a capitalist uh, approach. Well, in a sense, probably it's not the best, not the optimal thing for the church. But we live in the condition. We live under the circumstances when. But again, it's not a wild competition. In a sense, we try to exterminate one another. Right? It's more co uh, more cooperative. It's more. It's based on constructive communication, uh, uh, collaboration, solidarity, and so forth, which does not exclude some kind of, well. Yeah, competition. Uh, and do you think, yeah, I guess this is, I think it seems like it always had to be true on a spiritual level of, you know, this Heraclitian maybe, like that, you know, there's this productive uh, result of conflict, that all, everything is born of conflict, like on a very philosophical level, right? But it seems that there's, there is a Christian principle that there must be heresies amongst you or division amongst exactly. you. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Forget about the yeah. That's a very good point. And uh, what I want to, uh, well, to stress again is that, uh, or in addition, is that uh, this competition, this idea of competition or uh, coexistence of several jurisdictions, uh, which helps this coexistence, the churches to develop, to, to put emphasis on, on communities, now comes from diaspora to the traditional countries. And I believe Ukraine is the first instance of this. Because in Ukraine, with the establishment of a new autocephalous church, we, we have a completely new situation of two canonical jurisdictions coexisting with one another. In the same way as in diaspora, uh, canonical jurisdictions coexist with one another. In Ukraine, we have the first instance of a traditional country which has a situation of diaspora. And I believe this is very good for, for the country, for the church there, because those two jurisdictions, well, they are not exactly at good terms with one another at, at the moment. Uh, I don't want to, to analyze why this is so, but just constate a fact, uh, just make a statement, state a fact. Uh, but this situation uh, already helps those churches to reconsider their role in the society. They are not anymore monopolists in the Ukrainian society. They understand it. Uh, they need to demonstrate their best in order to be to remain attractive for for their faithful. Right, like recently, the Church of the Moscow Patriarchate had a wonderful uh, kind of congress conference on communities. Mm -hmm. It never happened before. No one gave a dime to the communities. Well, it might be I, I exaggerate, but well, it was the community was not as important as other administrative structures. Nowadays, community is important again in in Ukraine. Uh, if you take the new autocephalous church, it also struggles to, you know, to be, to demonstrate how friendly it is to the people, to the society, how uh, embracing it is, uh, how, uh, how Christian it is after all. So this contributes to, uh, this duality of the jurisdictions as well, contributes to, uh, to a new life, a uh, new quality of the church life, I believe. And I, well, why not other churches? have the same, I would say, in, in the traditional countries. Uh, we well, we that, face that's fascinating. And I suppose, well, that it's, it's one thing 
how that reflects on their outreach or lack thereof to the outside, right? Because you're talking about its sort of missionary potential of you have to do better if you want to survive uh, in this, I don't know, competition of, of jurisdiction or something. But as for the inside, if one understands the church community as based on, you know, like the, the 34th apostolic canon that's always often discussed in church structural, you know, discussions, and the whole issue of what the word ethnos means in that canon of the bishops of every nation must know the first amongst them, right? So, uh, so I'm wondering, and it's, you know, a lot has been written on that, but I think that a broad understanding of ethnos there that liberates people from, even though it's probably natural to form religious community around ethnicity, but it's not the only possibility, right? Especially in a globalized world where we're scattered amongst various ethnicities and to understand as there's this article, it's, it's sorry to my viewers for the obscure reference, but this makes my mind explode what Father Kirill say. Um, you know, a professor in Nicolaou wrote this big article about the meaning of ethnos in that canon and he happened to be a professor at my Munich Institute, so I, I'm well versed in this. Uh, anyway, but he had he showed that there's many possibilities of understanding that word, and so it's not territorial. So for people to form communities, I mean, we're talking a little bit hypothetically because we realize, you know, the larger question here is that certain systemic realities even if they've changed, even if their reality has changed today, we in orthodoxy don't seem to have the instruments to say, hey, that's no longer how we do things. We have to, even, you know, our canonical codex seems to be this, this, this unchangeable thing, even though everybody knows about those loads of canons that nobody even in principle follows, you know, like you can't befriend a Jew. I, I love canon 11 of Trullo, but you, there's certain things that, you know, we don't uh, uh, say in confession uh, that we did, like sought medical help from a Jew. Right. Uh, or a Armenian, right. <laughs> yes. You know, it doesn't enter our minds, but if we're going to be supposedly canonical, you know, that, that would be uh, indeed, uh, you know, a, a trespass of our canons. So what I want to say is that maybe this is where academic and systematic thinkers uh, that are trained to actually think and to discern uh, the, you know, the sources and to be able to distinguish the historically changeable in them and the unchangeable principle in them. It's, it's very simple, but we don't seem to want to articulate it, right? You, you question a canon and it's like, oh my God, they're betraying orthodoxy. That's exactly what I meant by serious attitude to the canons. If we are serious about the canons, we study their historical background. If we are not serious, we take them, you know, as a holy thing, as right. a divine institution given, you know, facts to us from God. Right. And then, but we end up really, we're not telling the truth because we know that it doesn't, it doesn't add up when you see, when we say, well, it's cat economia, you know, when we don't fulfill something, but economia doesn't mean that you are, in principle, you no longer see that that canon actually was, it's a historical phenomenon rather than a mystical one. So what, I, what, what I'm getting at is that the interesting thing is that we do have in the texts of the tools, because it is a wealth of canonical legislation. And like that canon 34 of the Holy Apostles, I think that it's embedded into there something very, you know, there's a beauty to the fact that it was never discarded, that it's not, you know, that somehow it's playing a role and it's there to be picked up and to say, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, it should be noticed, uh, I should, well, regarding this particular canon, it should be understood that it, uh, it is not apostolic in the sense that it was written by apostles. It appeared, it appeared yes, was uh, adopted and drafted in the fourth century when exactly this change, shift of the church from communities to the territories happened. And exactly this canon reflected this, this shift. Uh, we should understand this and be aware of this. Well, I think that we have, because it, because it is living, I, I would say it's a living text, that the ex the exegesis of which can change. You know, like 
scripture. The fact that Hebrews is not written by St. Paul is not the attribution to him that's traditional, is not contradiction, contradicting the fact that the church recognizes this to be, you know, like we name things a certain thing and then it doesn't, there are different levels of understanding a name or an attribution. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, absolutely, I'm absolutely. I know that that's not an epist. I think it's apostolic in the sense that the church understood it to be congruent with apostolic. Uh, anyway, I don't have to explain that to you. I, I agree. I agree. I just want to add to, to what, what 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 I said about the benefits of of, uh, uh, of competition between the jurisdictions. Just one thing, and it is really important. Uh, it's uh, this. The thing is that. Uh, the competition between canonical jurisdictions, canonical jurisdictions, I want to stress this, uh, not schismatic, canonical jurisdictions in one, in one state, in one uh, nation, uh, helps uh, to elevate the burden of the church administration upon, upon communities. Uh, what I mean is that the oppression of the church administration upon priest communities is less, is, uh, uh, is not as strong in the situation of competition than in the situation where there is one bishops in charge of the entire church, right? right. Uh, according to Canon 34, uh, Apostolic Canon 34. Uh, so uh, we already face this in Ukraine. Because of the danger that a community being abused by a bishop can switch to another canonical juris jurisdiction almost eliminates the potentiality, the possibility of abuses. Of what? Of, of abuses, right, right. Of abuses. Almost eliminates the potentiality, the possibility of abuses of, by a bishop of a community. I see. So it's like a check. Yeah, it's a check. Exactly. To the un... Yeah. Un and the, under, under the present circumstances of multiple abuses, of communities by the authorities in the church. I think it is very helpful at this stage, historical kind of, at this historical moment, to uh, have such a kind of coexistence of uh, canonical jurisdictions in one place. And it is, it is very obvious then that, the, commu that the, in the communities in diaspora, I believe that is my personal experience, I may be wrong, are healthier than the communities, many communities, or most communities, in the you know traditional countries, and this uh, healthier uh, state condition of those communities owes, I believe, largely to the competition, to the coexistence of several jurisdictions, mm -hmm. and also to the general more democratic framework of, of those societies. And would not be, in your view, a some kind of a contradiction to church unity. Not at all, because we are not speaking about the division of the church. We are speaking. We are speaking about the um, uh, kind of complexity of the church structures. The church structure should not should not be confused with the church per se. Those uh, jurisdictions that we are talking about, they are not the church. They are the structures of the church. They do not affect the nature of the church. The church remains the same. The church remains the same in Alexandria, in in Moscow. The two jurisdictions, canonical jurisdictions in Ukraine, they are just two uh, structures, different structures, but they uh, govern, they somehow manage the same, the same church. The same is in diaspora in the United States. Different jurisdictions do not divide the church into parts. It remains the same church. Therefore, uh, it does not affect the unity of the church. Moreover, it helps the unity of the church to be preserved. It helps the, the unity of the church. Thank you so much. As usual, very stimulating conversation, Father Kirill. You give us a lot to think about. And, uh, well, God help you on your extensive travels. Father Kirill is all over the place. If one follows him on Facebook, well, you're going to be in Africa one day, the next day somewhere in China, and I don't know where. So, uh, you know. I, I don't know either. <laughs> I, I hope you uh, take care of yourself. All right. Thank you. As you Thank you for, for this opportunity to, to talk to your resilience, and it, it was a pleasure to be with you. Thanks a lot, Father Kirill. All right, well, happy upcoming uh, Pentecost uh, to you. Uh, I think these topics are apropos, the Pentecost season. Uh, lovely to see you as usual. Okay, bye-bye, Father Kirill. Bye-bye, thank you.